Thank you for joining us at Mechanics Institute for this post-Valentine's Day program. We're gathering today to talk about the yin and yang of relationships, loss and love. The Writer's Lunch is a casual and virtual brown bag lunch activity on the third Friday of each month. Look forward to craft discussion, informal presentations on all forms of writing, and excellent conversation. My name is Nico Chen, and I am the program manager here at Mechanics Institute. For those of you who are new to Mechanics Institute, welcome. Mechanics Institute was founded in 1854 and is one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural events, cultural centers in the hearts of the city. Mechanics Institute features a full service general interest library, an internationally renowned chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and the cinema lit film series. A recent article in the San Francisco Standard describes us as the coolest library in downtown San Francisco and a remote work sanctuary. Come see this for yourself by joining us for a free tour, which happens every Wednesday at noon. You are also welcome to join us on a special evening tour on Friday, March 8th, starting at 5 p.m., which incidentally lands on International Women's Day. Light refreshments will be available during the welcome reception and complimentary beverages will be shared. Please visit our website, www.milibrary.org, to learn more about our upcoming programs. We have a variety of great events coming up with many in March, marking the celebration of Women's History Month. Today's theme for our Writer's Lunch is writing about love and loss and relationships. This discussion will include a Q&A with the audience, so please add your questions to the chat box, and I will read them aloud during the latter half of today's Writer's Lunch. Please also mark your calendars for our next Writer's Lunch, which is happening on March 15th. Um, the theme for the March 15th gathering will be Crossing Languages in Writing with Christina Garcia, whose writing often crosses into Spanish, Grace Lo Prasad, whose writing reconnects her to her native Taiwanese language, and Saskia Vogel, a Swedish to English translator. This event will also be obviously moderated by the wonderful Cheryl J. Bazet Bute. Say hi, Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. I see Alan. Alan, you still have your uh, Valentine's Day uh, colors there. Good for you. <laughs> and award winning author Cheryl J. Bazet Bute. Uh, and Pushkar Prize nominee is an Oakland multidisciplinary writer whose autobiographical and fictional short story collections, along with her lyrical and stunning poetry, artfully succeed in getting across deeper meanings about the politics of race and economics without breaking out of the narrative. An inaugural Oakland Poet Laureate runner-up, she is also a popular teacher, literary reader, presenter, storyteller, curator, and MC host for literary and poetry events. Next, we have the wonderful Lauren Alwyn. Say hello to the crowd, Lauren. She is a writer of fiction and nonfiction who lives and works in the San Francisco East Bay. Her stories and personal essays examine bicultural identity, cultural inheritance, and intergenerational relationships in which attachment and belonging play a central role. Her short story, An Amount of Discretion, which looks at family relationships through a lens of grief and loss, first appeared in the Southern Review and appeared in the O. Henry Price stories in 2018. Her fiction, as well as literary and personal essays, have appeared in a number of literary journals such as Ziziva and is forthcoming in the Alaska Quarterly Review. Next, we have Leslie Cook Campbell. Leslie, say hello to the crowd. And her debut short story collection, The Man with Eight Pairs of Legs, won the 2020 Mary McCarthy Prize for short fiction. Her collection is a 2022 Women's National Book Association Great Group Read selection, a finalist for American Book Fest 2022 Best Book Awards for Short Story, and a 2022 Ford Indies winner in short fiction. Her award-winning stories have appeared in numerous, numerous literary journals, and she is the author of Journey into Motherhood, Writing Your Way to Self-Discovery, and is published um, and has published um, feature personal essays in San Francisco Chronicle Magazine. Campbell is currently working on a second story collection called Free Radicals. She teaches at Ripe Fruits Writing, a creative writing program she founded in San Francisco in 1991. Last but not least, we have the wonderful Nona Caspers. Nona, say hello to the crowd. And BuzzFeed listed Nona Caspers' novel, The Fifth Woman, as a book queer women and everyone else should read. It was a Lambda finalist. Her other books of fiction include Little Books of Days and Heavier Than Air. 
which was awarded the, the Grace Paley Prize in Short Fiction and listed as a New York Times Book Review editor's choice. Casper's exquisite, quiet risk-taking writing, fine language for the trick of love and of daily existence itself. Lovers are here and then gone. We are all here and then gone. She is also the recipient of numerous awards, including a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, a Best American Notable Short Story, and more. Her work is forthcoming in Prairie, Su Prairie Schooner, <laughs> Cimarron, and North American Review. She teaches creative writing in the MFA program at San Francisco State University and lives in the city where she wanders the neighborhood with her, with her dog, Bora. <laughs> um, let's unmute and um, Cheryl, please take it away with our discussion today for Writer's Lunch. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you, Nona. And thank you, Mechanics Institute, and especially Nico Chin. Uh, I'm gonna launch right into it because you know we only have an hour and we wanna make sure that we get as much discussion as possible. So let me start by asking this question, convening question. You know, it's said that in writing, when writers write, there is something about writing about love and loss uh, that enables us as writers and humans to find our strongest connections. Uh, the strains that go through these topics and that topic together are universal. I will start with you, Leslie. How do you feel that manifests and what you write when you write about love and loss. Well, you're right. The, 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 these strains, the, these connections are universal. Um, uh, for example, motherhood, as you heard, I wrote a book on motherhood, is one a very important part of my identity. Uh, the, um, and then my own, my own parents. Um, mm -hmm. All, all of my key loves in my life are either uh, the seed and germ of one of my stories or one that I'm planning to write. You know, like no one, they, they engender so much uh, deep and prof profound vigor and uh, emotional content uh, and satisfaction too for me as a writer to kind of excavate those relationships through the stories that I write. Thank you. How about you, Lauren? Thank you for that question, Cheryl. Um, you know, I think uh, as one challenge of, of writing, especially when we begin a new project, but of course it can happen at any stage, is finding our way in, uh, finding a way, finding access to the emotion to the um to the real heart of of your subject and i think around this subject of love and loss it's particularly difficult um because it is so um you know those moments uh of of connection and loss are so huge in our lives so for me, I think the way that I find my way in is through attachment and what within the milieu or the, or the uh, characters I'm writing about, what I'm attached to. Um, it might be the setting, it might be elements of the setting, it might be um, uh, the backstory of the character that I want to explore more, as Leslie said, excavate. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and through those particulars, I think um, I do find my way in and hopefully to an emotion that um, even though I kind of know the territory I'm in, which is loss and love, um, I might discover something else about it that I didn't know. Exactly. I like that that part about attachment. You have to be attached. How about you, Nona? Yeah, I like that a attachment. I was thinking of that word and I was thinking, you know, yesterday was yesterday. Yeah. Valentine's Day. And I said to my students, happy big love day. Because I yeah. think that 
we channel so much of this, we think love and we think romantic love and it, all this energy gets channeled in that direction. And then I'm so glad Leslie brought up as well, there's just these myriad forms of love. And for me in my writing, the, <laughs> the characters, the people feel love the most when it's when it's gone not the love isn't gone but the person is either dead or vanished or broke the broken up or that there's something that i i try to find language for that like i'm pulled forward with my imagination to to maybe re-experience the person but also in fiction but also to just sort of understand that place. I mean, the first love of my life was a was a black mutt out in rural Minnesota. Second was my brother uh, Joel, who was born at the piece of his spine missing. And I, though that feeling, that passion that I had at that at th that young age, we don't think of that as uh, love in any conventional sense. And there's something that will then pressurize the writing from that passion those passions that i've felt and attachments and and um i think maybe that's i'll just stop there i think that says it well let me continue with you uh nona and ask you this question how does a writer prepare themselves to write about love and loss well i think for me because when when you have it, any kind of expansive emotion right? I think about the readings that I did, the craft readings around um, Richard Hugo's Triggering Town and I.R. Richards, and he writes about the difference between sentimentality and sentiment. So what I needed, I had to, I had to, you know, I went to an MFA, pro, I got the skills to, to, to then write, I needed the, the craft skills to then have that as part of my imagination to be able to find right the language and the scenes and the stories for that so sentiment versus sentimentality is something ir richards talks about and other people and just about getting closer so there's some sort of pleasure also in crafting right lauren and leslie and cheryl you know this all you writers know this and getting closer imagining beyond the familiar reduction of love but what what the textures and moments were yeah. actually like so that I think that's what you mean by there's that barrier of uh, not being able to see, not being able to see clearly and find true language for something that uh, has passion in it or a big grief in it. Um, but to me, it has to do with craft and getting closer and laboring into beyond the familiar social reductions that were fed all the time, right? Even balance. Right, exactly. Day. Exactly. Yeah. So, so the, the partnership between uh, the craft and the imagination. Yes. Being able to get to get there. It, uh, what about you, Lauren? Wow, that was that was wonderful. Uh, yeah. Thank you for articulating all that. Um, that that idea of getting closer um, is why I don't know a story might I, I one story the. Uh, the, the Southern Review story that was mentioned in my bio. I mean, I, I worked on that story for 18 years. It took a long time to get closer to the heart of the loss in that story. And there's a great loss in that story. Um, I think I began uh, with an image and before I knew really anything and, and began that process, that arduous process of getting closer, I started with an image and I had an image of a woman alone in a house with a kind of exhalation that was taking place in her. And it wasn't one of relief, it was one of loss. I knew that very clearly. So I had to reverse engineer the story so that I ended up there. And it took a long time because um, especially around the topic of loss, you're, you're writing about absence and it's hard to write about something that is missing. Um, more than a few times, my husband said to me, he said, you know, you're, you need to, how can you write about something that's not there, you know, because the character in this story had, had lost so much and um, was kind of steeled, uh, steeled herself emotionally against the world. And yet 
there was something she wanted and it was to continue a relationship with her uh, deceased husband's uh, stepson. That was the, the closest thing she had to a child. But um, getting closer to that was, was difficult in part because of all the absences. So how did I do that? Um, I did it through portraying, the whole story takes place inside a house and I did it by portraying the setting of the house, the objects inside it, the belongings that she, that meant a lot to her and that had kind of um, been the um, props in a way to her life. They had been there um, all along. So I did find a way to get closer through concrete objects. Um, oh. And that was kind of a, a learning um, experience for me in writing that story was how objects can, uh, beyond just the objective correlative, um, be characters in the story to help um, move it forward, you know, to its to its end point. Well, thank you, Leslie. There's so much to talk about about love. I never know where to begin. I know. Oh my gosh. But I was thinking, you know, 18 years for a story, certainly it's taken me many years to get into a lot of my stories. But one example is that this piece I wrote basically three days after my mother passed away called Mother Load. Uh, and the first line is a daughter is unable to part with her mother's body. And the story, she actually is with her mother's body. You know, it starts out just being, you know, a few hours, but then a day and another day, then like the Buddhists do it three days, and then it goes right. on to months, years, um, and so on. And she stays with her mother's body until it's just bones. That I feel like, you know, one of the things that I teach is something called what I call the writing faith, F-A-I-T-H, which means that we always write what we need to write. And my goal is always to just free myself up internally as much as possible. And, and so that encourages, I think, the imagination. I want my, I need my heart to be open. I know it takes a lot. It, and in fact, one of the things I was thinking of when you were talking is, how do I do it? I cry. <laughs> like exactly. when I read some of the things I'm writing, I cry because, and that's a good sign because then I know I've touched a, a nerve, you know, that I've wrenched my heart, you know, in a, in a place that, that feels important, you know? So, so in addition to sometimes definitely stories I've written where there's a lot of distance. I'm working on a story now, dark to themselves. It's related to, in that case, a romantic relationship that that ended and so on, that was years ago. But then there's that mother load, you know, I, I just, you know, my, my mother's body was actually in my home when I was writing it, you know, um, and, and, and then, and love is so complicated. You know, it, there's, a mother's relationship with her daughter is so complicated. So how to get the 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 the, the mourning, the the special kind of love that I had have and have for my mother and um and all the complications of that relationship, you know, all in the same, in this case, a short piece. And one other thing I wanted to say because I thought of it when Nona was talking about sentiment and sentimentality is uh uh, Yi Young Lee, when I studied with her once at the Napa Valley Writers Conference, she she talked about reading Tolstoy's War and Peace every year, and how she learned that into to get at the the real terror of uh, and, and visceral horror of war yeah. um, that the talking about a a dog wound on the battlefield you know, some, a small detail, you know, rather than confronting, facing on people shooting, I don't know, people dying, bombs blasting, um, like focusing on, like looking at a you know, slant, as Emily Dickinson said, you know, going slant to the small detail that isn't in the center of things. And, and always in, in general, just to, to pull back when things are overly dramatic to, um, what is that saying that the F-O-R-O-I-D, foi, there's a saying about that, that 
Amy Hempel used to use. Does anyone get, do no no do you know what I mean? No. Oh, okay. Anyway, but it's a kind of coolness towards what's so hot. <laughs> so in that moment and, and how that your right one's writing self as we mature as writers then can handle it um in 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 a way that feels very true and doesn't over dramatize. Right. Thank you. Uh, let me pick a piggyback just for a second on the, the crying part. Um, it took me 10 years to write a scene for uh, a book that was so horrendously tragic. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't face it. So I put it into a historical novel where it belonged because it happened some time ago. And I have to tell you, I relate to the crying. I cried the whole way through writing that scene because it was so ugly, but it was the best scene in the book mm -hmm. and remains so in my mind. And I think writers know when their stuff is good and when it's not, we, we know. Um, but that being said, the crying is there. How about the humor? Do any of you inject humor? into your stories of love and loss? And how do you do that? And where do you do that? Norna? Well, um, I think, okay, so this, I, I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know about the word inject because I don't think it's conscious, but in the consciousness of whatever the characters are, there is some way that my own humor, which tends to be a little uh, tilted and I don't know, somebody called it, did they use the word wry or dry? How strange. I don't think of myself that way. Um, <laughs> but um, but because there's a, a, a sort of natural way of seeing the world's absurdities and then uh, the closer I, you can look at something, there's a way that the absurdities make reveal themselves um, in the mm -hmm woman in the fifth woman um she's in this room and um that was that was that book was compelled by trying to find language for um a really big deep sudden loss oh years and years before I could find the language for it um a, a girlfriend who I'd moved here with and um in the book, it's it's death. So there's the complete absence, the entirety of death, and yet not because because death, the person comes even closer in a way in the memory and imagination for a while anyway. So when I started finding the language for it, I think there's just an absurdity in in the details of life that starts to come forward <laughs> from my point of from my tilted way anyway. So she, in one way to find language was through metaphor and what some people might call the other dimension, um, that she's walking through her apartment. She doesn't know if it's night or day and when everybody else is asleep, she's awake and when everybody else, and, and then at the end, she just sees, she looks up and she's staring at the wall and she sees a stain on the, on the wall of her fallen down, broken down, fallen apart apartment building in San Francisco, which is a place, one of the places I lived. Um, cheap, cheap. And um, then there, it looked like a jellyfish. And there's something absurd about that within all of this, you know, time is different for her and the darkness and the slowness. And then there's the jellyfish and you're left with this jellyfish and I would call that humor. It's just, right. there's, yeah, there's something absurd built in and that's a shape on the wall, but that's looking closely and then something, you know, imposing itself on that. But I don't, I like jellyfish a lot. That's all I know. I think they're hilarious. <laughs> that's all that's I know great. that I came from that. It's because they are hilarious jellyfish. That's great. Lauren? Well, Cheryl, that's a tough one for me because I find humor, I feel like I'm still learning that. And um, my the stories that um, I've worked on the most and that have been published tend to have a more, because they are about 
largely about loss, they do tend to have a, um, a more, you know, somber side to them. Although I have to say, um, I do love um, injecting strangeness in and, yeah. and a bit of uh, circumstantial dissonance, I guess, to sort of um, to, to counter that, you know, because, uh, because that's how life is. And um, so I tend to, I'll, I'll put my characters in situations that are maybe unexpected um, to, as, as a way of countering that heaviness. Um, um, I don't have a jellyfish, anything nearly as good as a jellyfish. Um, but I did have a character after she had broken an object in her grandmother's china cabinet. Uh, it was an award her father had gotten. I had her out deciding out in the backyard to bury it, um, which isn't exactly humorous, but it is, um, it was a bit absurd, I guess. And I'm, I'm comfortable shifting into a bit of absurdity uh, to counter the loss. Um, because as she's digging, of course, uh, this takes place in the San Gabriel Valley in Los Angeles, where I grew up, and the dirt's really hard there. So it's quite hard to dig. And um, I had some empathy for my character in, you know, being so set on doing this. Um, and it was a bit hard for her. And I was just hoping that that unexpected dissonance in, in the situation, she's, the character is six years old, um, might uh, bring a bit of just a counter, you know, a, a lightness in, in to shade, to offset the dark. I think that's about the closest I think I could get to humor is that absurdity. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, in, in injecting something other than that the sadness of loss uh, yes. continually. Uh, how about you, Leslie? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm so serious. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, that's why I end up sobbing when I'm writing my stories. Uh, and, but I, I totally connect with like the strangeness, the odd situation. Um, even the one I mentioned earlier, Motherload. I mean, that's uh, that that took me to a strange place. This daughter staying with her mother for years, um, and at some point, her mother's corpse uh, specifically. So, I mean, there was a moment when uh, she 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 takes a a selfie with her mother's corpse and and notes that her mother isn't smiling. Uh, you know, th that's pretty uh, black humor, I would say, dark humor. Um, and so th there is. Um, because maybe and maybe because it was so recent you know since like i said she was her body was in my family home and i was there too uh it just went in these weird places but and another thing that i thought of is um just in the ca character who does things that are are funny like even like in my story thunder in illinois which is in my collection the man with eight pairs of legs um I mean, it starts out the 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 first line is Mr. Evans, who still loves Mrs. Evans, has thought up a dozen ways to leave her. So it sort of begins with a sort of tongue in cheek thing, and then Mrs. Evans is the kind of person who, at a gas station, you know, make, wants it to be all exactly six zero zero zero, you know, for how many gallons she gets. And if oh, I know her. She keeps going. <laughs> as it does, it, so some of the gas ends up filling, you know, if it's over the tank, <laughs> it's on her shoes, you know, and so, uh, and she's involved while her husband is dying and her husband who has cheated on her. Also, she, as she's learned, um, she, she's, they're playing a game that's a cumulative game that they've been playing for, uh, for 35 years, you know, of a word game and she's winning, you know, they, they have, that's over a million points for each one. Uh, so, you know, there's just so much in, in life. What can I say? You know, when you start yeah, exactly. about life, it includes incredible love, incredible sadness. And um, these moments, unexpected moments that you could just, you know, slap your knees of hilarity or absurdity. Wonderful. 
Do you um, consider your readers when you write about love and loss? Uh, I know when I wrote the scene that took me 10 years to write, I just felt I wanted to write it. And I really, I got some pushback from some people who thought that didn't happen. That couldn't have happened. Oh, but indeed it did. Um, do you consider those kinds of things when you were writing about love and loss? Lauren? That's a great question. Um, I have to say that I think for, I'm kind of a sentence by sentence person. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I have the um, habit of not being able to go to the next sentence until the one before it is pretty much the way I want it, which is I've heard a lot is not the way to do it all the time, but it's just how, how it is. So, um, um, oh gosh, I got so stuck in my sentences. Tell me the question again. <laughs> <laughs> do you consider the reader? Oh, right. So to be able to do that, um, I really do have to be inside the text. Uh, yep. to be able to move sentence to sentence. So um, I'm afraid I don't because um, I, certainly I want to, I want my sentences to be readable. I want them to have a logic. I want them to have uh, as much integrity as each sentence can have. Um, and in, so in a way I'm writing for a reader because I want that sentence to be uh, pleasurable to read but in crafting it I have to say I'm just inside that sentence I'm inside the syntax I'm inside the word choice I'm inside the rhythm of it I'm inside where words are short and where words are long I mean all those things that you obsess about you know or at least I obsess about when I'm 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 writing a sentence so um yeah so I think probably Probably not thinking about readers at that point. Um, I hear you. Nona? You... Readers? Who? Um, no, right. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, okay. I think that I'm, I, I like how uh, uh, Lauren put it in that I'm, I'm very much inside the, what's happening with the sentence and um and then i'm and what's happening with is kind of embodying the character um and then at the later drafts when things are coming together I'm thinking of the fifth woman i and little book of days i don't remember about heavier than air i um I do, these feelings start coming up of, oh, something, this is too heavy or this is too, you know, I get those voices. So I think that's when the reader slips in, it's when I start going, oh, this is too, and, but not in a bad way, because then what I do is somehow that rolls around inside of me and I sort of see, is there another piece that needs to be added? Is there a way that I can craft this so that maybe it's not allowing in enough room. Maybe there's, it needs uh. air or something. Um, also, I have real readers in a, in a writer's group I've been in for a long time. One of them is here, Barbara Tomash. She's an amazing poet. And another poet named um, Anne Pelletier and, and Jesse Nissim. So uh, the, uh, one of them is also works in fiction. Um, so I, I have reader readers, so I have people who will, they tell me things too, and I listen, I listen. So I have, you know, lots of us have that. I, there's nothing like it. So, you know, Kathy Rose and I work together. I don't know if Kathy's here. I think she is. And Geljor and I. So I have those readers who give me like feedback. Mm -hmm. But I do get those voices, and I think that that must be the consideration of, but it's later, way later. Mm -hmm. And then I maybe will, like in Little Book of Days, I added some dream days to break up the rhythm, 
uh, or, you know, based on both feedback and my own feeling that it was too, the rhythm was too repetitive in the days because it's day after day after day. Mm -hmm. um, these, I don't know, they could be called prose poems or little vignettes. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I, I think, I think later I consider the readers who are my readers and give me feedback very seriously because they're such, they're generous and they know me, but, and they care about my work a lot. So I listen to them closely and I also do get those other voices, which I can only, that must be the, the, the consciousness of, okay, now this, if this is out in the world, what, what might be missing? Is there enough air for everybody to breathe? I don't know. That's the best I can say. <laughs> Good advice. How about you, Leslie? Uh, I I mean, I have had so many students uh, over the years and know that when people are thinking about their readers early on in the process, it just stops the yeah. the creative juices from going. Yeah. So I'm yeah. with no, I'm with Nona and and I'm with Lauren on when I'm creating, when I'm generating. I'm not thinking of, uh, I, I can't think, I don't maybe even have the intellectual capacity or emotional breadth to think about a million people out there who might might or might not ever see my, my sentences. Um, it's just this world, I'm totally immersed. Um, and if I'm not, you know, uh, it's, it's not working. So I mean, I'm a, I'm a writer who works intensively, you know, for hours and hours on end into the night and then and then maybe take a break. So that's how I work. Um, and and then also similar to Anona, I I mean I could I I have in my acknowledgement so many people for my debut short story collection, <laughs> Man with Eight Pairs of Legs. Like so <laughs> many people, it it wouldn't have happened if you know they. And I went to a number of summer writing workshops. Um, for example, Bread Loaf, Tin House, Napa Valley Writers Conference, as I mentioned, and more. And those, I am so thankful for those strangers, you know, like 11 strangers in each case around a table and um, things they say. There's, I, there's, I find there's no better, that's a little different than, than what Nona was talking about with this group of fiction writers who, who bonded, but they're absolute strangers, different ages. Um, but there's no greater gift, I feel, for me as a writer than to have someone closely read my work you know, before it's totally, totally done. And of course, after it's done too. But during the process of development, uh, there's, I, I just always listen to what they have to say, no matter how devastating sometimes. And one time at the Napa Valley Writers Conference, um, and, and, and I was working on the Tasmanians, and they were, someone said, I can't have this this character, I can't have the objects going for the grandmother and, and also having the trees cutting down, you know, and I was just sobbing in the parking lot afterwards and called my best friend in LA and said, I can't write anymore. <laughs> uh, so, you know, but but I listened, you know, it takes time then to digest some of that, take that in. And that that story did not need that character that they, that they were like killing off. It at all it became a much stronger story, and in each case, it's become a stronger story. So, um, so th those people have been reading in the development process. So there's all these stages, right? And then one other thing I want I, that I think of is when I'm writing them so close to about people that I know, right? So, for example, Mr. and Mrs. Evans, since I mentioned it before, was very much inspired by my parents, you know. And I really wanted, and my father had passed away. My mother was alive and I wanted her to read it, you know? So, um, you know, and she said, um, it wasn't her, she, and there I am all she said, it wasn't my favorite story of yours, but that was a lot better than saying, you better not write that, you know? Yeah, exactly. You can't write that. I'll, I, you know, I'll remember it to the day I die, you know? Um, or, uh, and then one, uh, uh, one other quick example is a dark to themselves when I said I'm writing about a love relationship there's a lot of things based on a lot of our love letters that are actually in there so I've talked to her uh sisters her three sisters a couple of her people who she was with after me you know I just sort of wanted to to just to see even a draft um and and then in terms of readers more like you were saying Sheila you know if I'm writing about Armenians which in one case or something like that I I or someone who's a double amputee, which I am not, 
Um, I do so much research. I talk to so many people and I always have people who are within that group. So Armenian friends and acquaintances read that story to make sure that that it, it felt true to them. And, you know, and so then the delight is when they say that the, my grandmother thought it was written by an Armenian. Then I know I've I've done my uh, work. That's how to avoid appropriation. There you go. Uh, that's the way to do it. That's a whole other subject we can get into uh, in another <laughs> in another time. Thank you. Right, right. So, uh, Nico, do we have any questions from the audience? We sure do. Um, so Casey actually has two questions. So um, I'll start with the short one, and this is directly directly at Nona. Regarding the jellyfish, did you decide to include the jellyfish for absurdity and humor, or did it organically show up for you as you were writing? It showed up. It showed <laughs> up in that room, in that moment, in that state, in that place that the narrator was living in, in that moment, yeah, in that crappy apartment <laughs> <laughs> with bars on the window falling off, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for your direct answer. And here's a question from Casey for everyone. How do you begin writing into Love and Loss? Do you see yourself as a choreographer or director of these major themes when writing, or do you rewrite and then sift, or is it more about collaging pieces? Basically, is your process the same when you are writing to any topic, or is there a new process born in juggling such a significant topic such as love and loss? How about Lauren, you start with that one. Wow, that's an amazing question. Um, I have to say, I think when it it happens that as I begin a story, if I, such as the example I gave with the image of the woman in in alone in the house that I began with, I I knew there was going to be loss there, but yet in beginning the story, um, um, of course there were many failed attempts at the start of the story, but when I finally got to the correct uh, beginning. It was the same as in a story about any topic, which is I accessed the voice that was telling this story, whether it was first person or third person, no matter, there needed to be a voice there. And I was able to access the voice and I was able to access the, the point at the best point at which to enter into the story. Yeah. Didn't, I want to emphasize it didn't happen the first time I was a few years in, uh, but um, but when I when I found my way in, it was because of uh, finding the right voice. And by voice, I mean an emotional perspective. Uh, so we've been talking about you know emotion in during writing uh, about loss, and yet I find. With my hard heart, it's best if I have a lot of emotional distance so that, as, as Leslie pointed out, I can um, most effectively make choices about what needs, what got, maybe what's gone too far, maybe what's not far enough emotionally. Um, there's so many choices to make, but the voice is the guiding, is the ship that's guiding you through through those choices, at least it is for me. So um, there really is no alternate approach for material that's uh, more intense emotionally. Um, as long as I've got that voice and as long as I've got an idea, and often it's just instinct about the type, the way that that voice would tell the story, then I find I've got, I've got my anchor. I've got my anchor yeah. and I can go forward. What do you think, Leslie? Well, my my first thought is that I I just write from my body, yeah, I, and um, I don't know exactly how to explain it more than that, um, in in a lot of ways. So there's this visceral thing, and to answer the question, is it different for love and loss? No, I don't think so. Every time, I I I carry story ideas around for years and years. I'm not a prolific writer. I don't I don't have thousands of stories, dozens of stories. 
or even dozens of stories. The stories in my debut collection are the stories I cut my fiction teeth on. They're the original ones that I wrote. And I kept working on them and working on them. And I was just thinking for each story, there always there's this just devotion um, and a commitment, devotion and love, I think, you know, maybe there's love. I never thought of it that way um, of for whatever is happening. It's like to me, like going into a foreign country, you know, and looking at what are the restaurants or the foods like? What does it smell like in the streets? You know, what? Whoa, 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 look at this museum, meeting somebody that you never knew before. How? Where did they come, come from? What does that do? You know, it's this whole uh, scary, incredibly thrilling and enjoyable pleasure to, to go into these different um, to these different worlds. And the other thing I thought of is that when I think about, because I was thinking before this this talk about all the stories in my uh, in that collection, and then and then um, the stories I'm working on now, and they're all about love and loss. They're all about love and loss. So they're in one way or another, but different kinds of love, as I've said, between a daughter and a mother, or a son and their father, between uh, a a husband, you know, uh, having an intellectual mistress in the uh, heroin addict who lives next door because they both love Heidegger and Paul Salon, you know, there's unconventional loves of all kinds that cross different kinds of borders. Um, I, I tend not to go towards romantic love, but love in its many permuta per permutations, you know, uh, it seems like everything is about that. And then there's always loss with love because like with Mr. Evans and Mrs. Evans, there's this long marriage. And I was thinking about they loved each other at the end, even with all the difficulties, but how, you know, there's loss and love because it's not like it was yesterday, you know, and then the four months later, it's not like it was in the beginning and 10 years in 10 years and 50 years later, in this case, this long marriage, you know, it's still love, but what love is that? So I'm interested in exploring all these kinds of love and the way love okay. evolves, destroys and uh, changes form. Wonderful. Any more questions from the audience, Nico? Um, we don't have any other questions, but I do have a question that emerges for myself. Oh. We've been talking about love all this time, but we have yet to actually define that word. So what's like your personal definition of that word love? Leslie? Oh my gosh. It's this it's magic. It's a <laughs> miracle. Uh, it's, um, I think I, you know, because I've, I've come to learn and have felt for a long time that I was set here on this planet to understand compassion. And then I have to say, what is compassion? And it, and it's very much about listening to someone else, to really listening about someone else, you know, uh, regardless of what they feel about gun control or regardless of what they think <laughs> of anything, you know, um, to be able to really take in another person, completely let go of my own ego, my own ideas, um, and to to keep working on that through my life. Um, and, and, and in a grand way too, uh, people in another nation, um, in another country, uh, losing their children in a war uh, and, it's love to me is I think is really compassion. I mean, that's it. That's what it really comes down to. And then I can only hope that when the close people I love, you know, my own two sons, um, the, 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 my closest, closest friends and family, my partner, they, um, my goal is always to have my love be seated in that kind of compassion. And you know, it's not that easy to just listen to the person you live with, <laughs> you know, knee jerk react. <laughs> but it's an ongoing work, it's a process. Thank you, Nona. Okay, so the question is, what is love? <laughs> what is your definition of love? I don't, I don't have a definition, but the closest I can come is when I think about, I just, taught this Edward Said article on the philology of language from democratic humanism and, and, and the, the warmth 
of great act uh, of, of the warmth of true attention and seeing the true face. Yeah. Here, here. Lauren. That's beautiful, Nona. Um, you know, I have to say, I come back to attachment. Um, for me, that, um, and it, in its varying degrees, um, it really defines, for me, which is uh, a love is kind of undefinable. Um, but I understand it best as an attachment that may be um, emotional, but it might also be physical as in attachment to place. Um, um, certainly we're attached to things, but you know, saying I love my car is not exactly the same as I love this place in the desert where I feel the way I did when I was nine. Um, you know, there's, but, but yet these, these different types of attachments, I feel really do drive a deeper uh, connection. And for me, um, that, that, connection that can happen with a person or a place um, suggests to me different types of love for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I think Leslie mentioned the word devotion. That's um, part of it, certainly. Um, but I really do come back to, to that sense of and, and what I mean by attachment is, I and I think what happens when we do attach to a person or a place is we see uh, a kind of our, ourselves in that other person. We see, we want to see parts of them in ourselves. We want to, you know, maybe embody certain things about them. There's kind of a, an interesting transmission that goes on, you know, when that, when that happens. And um, certainly a very, uh, it's interesting territory for uh, writing and literature, for sure. Well, let, let me ask this, which which may be the the last the last question we could get in here, um, and I'm and I'm going to uh, take that word that you just used, transmission, Lauren, and I'm going to ask you all, um, what have you learned about yourselves in writing about love and loss, and how do you think it is going to influence or um, hands or feed your future writing projects. Lauren? Um, well, in, I have to, I'm thinking now of the stories that have succeeded. Um, <laughs> the ones that haven't succeeded yet are just, you know, uh, it's different. But the ones that- well, well, what about the stories that you love the most? that I've written or others have written that you've written that I've written I think they have um I think in externalizing a lot of the emotion that came up when I was writing them um that's certainly been a kind of cathartic experience because um in externalizing it, you do feel a bit lighter around that subject. You get, for me, I get a bit of distance. And I think that's, especially around, around loss, I think that can be really helpful because it teaches, at least for me, it's, it's, it, it teaches me um, how to keep going, how to be more resilient, um, how to not, unlike some of the characters I've written, be destroyed by it um, because it can destroy us. It can, it can, um, loss can uh, reduce us, you know, in our capacities. And, and as a human, you know, with the limited amount of time we have here, uh, I think that resilience is, is really important. So I think definitely the stories have, have made me more resilient emotionally um, and maybe more willing to take risks. You mentioned in stories going forward, I think we're willing to take more risks emotionally in stories. Thank you. How about you, Leslie? So what is the question? How has it changed me to, to approach these? these? Well, how, how um, 
has, what have you learned about yourself in writing about love and loss? And how do you think it's going to um, manifest or, or enhance your, your future projects? Well, it's sort of, it's related to my last question. I, I, I believe that, that I, uh, it, it helps me in my road to being a more compassionate person uh, to have spent so much time with all these other people. I mean, if you don't write, then you, you know, you might have, I don't know, maybe you have a partner, maybe you don't, maybe you have a few friends. Uh, it, so it adds to the panoply of relationships that um, I curate and experience and feel connected to in my life. And so I, I, I learned so much from that. I think that foreign country is part of it because, you know, that's going into for, foreign territory, always informed um, by myself. Uh, I remember the, my title story, The Man with Eight Pairs of Legs. Um, there's a lot of love. Um, there's potential loss. It's one of the few stories that ends up on seemingly kind of a happy note. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. I remember when I did a workshop with Charles D'Ambrosio in Tin House, when I had just grad graduated from my MFA program, which I went to in my late 50s, by the way, um, went back to school. And um, he, I had a one-on-one -on -one with him. And he looked at me straight in the eye and he said, do you have the courage to write this story? <laughs> have the courage and I'm like and it just like whoa it was so confronting mm -hmm. right it was so confronting and he's such I mean he's a wonderful writer but he's a brilliant teacher uh and so I just thought my god he he's seen into my psyche and beyond my psyche and into the future uh like or something and 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 in fact that title story um I went to three different workshops over eight years I brought it to bread loaf I brought it to juniper and I kept working on that story um all that time and I and I just always felt wow do I have the courage to write the stories that I really want to write do I and um I feel like I have because I've achieved that and and it's it's out there and and people are, it's rewarding to hear what people are experiencing but because we have to have an incredible amount of courage to write the things that people are going to really respond to exactly that, that makes allows them to be vulnerable and let things in and learn about themselves and so, yeah, it's, it's, it admitted, but do I have courage to write the next stories I'm going to write? Oh my God, there's a story that called the dinner with a mortician um, f that I know I've had in my mind for quite a while, but damn, if I can't, I cannot get to the desk to start writing that story. I don't want to die. <laughs> You'll get there. How about, <laughs> anyway, you know, well, there's a lot to learn. Yeah. I'll just say two, two, two words, which is, um, allowed me and a, a honest looking at, at myself and others honestly and um, honesty, intimacy. Yeah. Nice. On those two words, I will say thank you very much, ladies. <laughs> thank, thank you, Nico Mechanics Institute. This was great. Of course, and I want to suggest for all of our attendees today, if you can, turn on your video and just kind of pulse love at our special guests for today. Thank you so much um, for sending the love into our writerly community for this beautiful conversation today. Um, within our chat box, I do also want to point you to the fact that we are holding a course at Mechanics Institute on this very topic on March 23rd with Joey Garcia, who is also at the SF Writers Conference. And we also have a slew of wonderful free events coming up that I'm also adding into our chat box. I will honor everyone's time. It is 1 p.m. Let's pulse love again as we um, exit this space. And we hope to see you again next month on March 15th for our next Writer's Lunch. Take care, everyone. Everyone. Thank you. Hello. Bye, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you.